What does Matthew 18 verses 18 through 20 mean? I'll say that again. What does Matthew 18, 18 through 20 mean? So let's turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, and we'll read verses 18 through 20. Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So the first thing we need to do in trying to understand what those verses are talking about is we need to identify the relevant cross-references. What we just read is in Matthew 18, verses 18 through 20. You'll see something very similar in Matthew 16, verse 19. So if you would, turn with me to Matthew 16, verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shalt be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Well, Matthew 16, verse 19, sounds an awful lot like Matthew 18, verse 18. So in order to understand Matthew 18, what we should do is try to understand Matthew 16. So we're in Matthew 16, verse 19. Let's just go up a single verse to Matthew 16, verse 18. Matthew 16, verse 18. And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now let's pause there and remind ourselves of how the second person pronouns work in the King James Bible. Today we use the word you, Y-O-U, and we use the word you for things that are singular and things that are plural. And we use the word you as both a subject and an object. So if you think about that, there's really four different situations. An object that is singular, an object that is plural, a subject that is singular, and a subject that is plural. In modern English, we use the word Y-O-U for all four of those situations. But that's not what the King James Bible does. The King James Bible uses thou, thee, ye, and you. What that does is that enables you, just by looking at the word itself, to immediately tell whether the, the word is singular or plural, whether it's used as a subject or an object. So with that background, now look at Matthew 16, verse 19 again. And I say also unto thee. Thee is singular, and thee is when you is used as an object. So here's what that tells us. The promise that is made in that verse was made to a singular person. It was made unto thee, and it was made unto Peter. So we understand who that applies to. Now look with me then at verse 19, the very next verse. And I will give unto thee. Well, who's the thee in verse 19? Obviously, it's the same person that was the thee in verse 18. So verse 19 is obviously a promise intended for Peter. Now, just knowing that right there tells you that these verses do not apply during the dispensation of grace. If you think of Galatians 2 verse 7, and 2 verse 7, 2 verse 8, 2 verse 9, that entire passage, it's very clear that Peter and Paul have different ministries. They have different gospels. They go to different audiences. And so what we're reading about in Matthew 16 and Matthew 18, where there is a promise given specifically to Peter, it would be wrong for us to try to claim that as something that is operating for us today because that was obviously given specifically to Peter. 
Now we're in Matthew 16. As I mentioned earlier, it's always good to look at the context. Look at verse 23. What some people do is they look at Matthew 16 and Matthew 18 and they say, well, look, Peter was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven. But let's be very, very careful in thinking about that. Look with me at verse 23. This is only four verses after verse 19. Matthew 16, 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Now consider how shocking that is. In verse 19, the Lord talks about the keys to the kingdom of heaven. They're to be given unto Peter. And just four verses later, Peter is in such error that what the Lord has to do is he has to rebuke him and say, Get thee behind me, Satan. Think about this. Did the Lord just give the keys to the kingdom of heaven to someone who was unfit to drive? Right after the keys are mentioned in verse 19, four verses later, the Lord says to the very same person, Get thee behind me, Satan. Think about it this way. Is it a smart thing to give your keys to the car to a drunk driver? It's a terrible thing. Because that person is in a position where they don't have the judgment to drive properly. So you would never want to give them the keys. Bad consequences would follow. Well, what happened here in Matthew 16? Did the Lord make an incredible mistake? Did he give the keys to Peter? And then Peter was so confused that the Lord had to rebuke him only four verses later? Well, we know the Lord would never make a mistake. So what's the explanation? Look with me at Matthew 16, verse 19. And, and this is a, an example of how we need to read things very, very carefully. Matthew 16, verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The Lord didn't give the keys to Peter in Matthew 16, verse 19. He said that he will give them to him in the future. He didn't give them to him at that point. In other words, let's just be super clear on this. If you say, I will give you this, what you're doing is you're stating something that you will do in the future. But it is not the actual delivery of those keys at that moment in time. Get with me Mark 16. Mark chapter 16. Now, in Mark chapter 16, we are post the crucifixion and we are post the resurrection. The Lord Jesus Christ has risen from the dead at this point. Look with me at Mark 16, verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven. This is the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. He appeared unto the eleven. Well, you know who the 11 is. It's the 12 minus 1, the 1 being Judas. So the 11 would include Peter and James and John and so on. Afterward, he appeared unto the 11 as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart. So were the 11 operating in faith? Apparently they weren't. The Lord had to upbraid them because of their unbelief and their hardness of heart. Because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. So let me suggest this to you. It would have been a bad decision. It would have been wrong for the Lord to give the keys to the kingdom of heaven to Peter when Peter was himself confused. When Peter himself was acting in unbelief when Peter himself was suffering from what the Lord calls hardness of heart. So what's going on here? Get with me one more verse. Get John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And we're going to look at verse 23. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. In John 20, verse 23, the Lord grants authority to the apostles 
that's very similar to what he said in Matthew 16 and in Matthew 18. It's described here in John 20 as the authority to remit and retain sins. Now ponder that for a minute. Did, did the Lord just give a sinful man the authority to decide whose sins would be forgiven and whose sins wouldn't be? Wouldn't that be just a crazy thing to do? Well, notice something with me, if you would. In John chapter 20, verse 23, if you look at the preceding verse, it doesn't end in a period, does it? So for us to understand verse 23, we have to read verse 22. John 20, verse 22, And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He says that before he gives them the authority to remit sins. Now, why is that significant? Here's why. Get John 14. John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. When the Lord Jesus Christ gave the Holy Ghost to the twelve, what he was doing is he was giving to them the comforter that was going to teach them all things. So now if you think through the chronology, hopefully you'll see how it makes sense. In Matthew 16, what the Lord does is he says to Peter, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't say I'm giving them to you right now. And Peter was in no position at that time to exercise the authority of the keys to the kingdom of heaven because he himself was confused. He didn't understand the cross. He didn't understand the resurrection. Even as late as Mark 16, 14, Peter was upbraided for his unbelief. But what the Lord Jesus Christ did in John chapter 20 is he breathed on them and he said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And what the Holy Ghost was going to do is it was going to teach them all things. If the Holy Ghost taught them all things so that they knew what God the Father wanted them to know, then, then Peter could safely exercise the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And let me show you, for example, how extraordinary the work of the Holy Ghost is. So look with me at John chapter 2. So we were in John 20 when the Lord uh, breathed on the 12 and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. I want you to notice what happens just a couple chapters later in Acts chapter 2. And we'll look at these verses, and I'll just put it this way. What the Holy Ghost does in Acts 2 is extraordinary. Acts 2 verse 1, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now you may think I'm being silly about this, but that's the work of the Holy Spirit. If you get a group of believers together and they're all in one accord, that's a miraculous thing. That doesn't happen naturally because we all have a flesh nature and you know that. So for a group of believers to all be in one accord is nothing less than the working of the Holy Ghost. Verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. You can see that. Verse 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Verse 46, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness, and notice this, and singleness of heart. Their hearts were all aligned together. So hopefully you can see what's going on. The verses that are described in, in Matthew 18, 18 through 20, the verses in Matthew 16, 18 and 19, the verse in John 20, 23, where the Lord grants broad authority to Peter and the apostles, that has nothing to do with Paul. That has nothing to do with the body of Christ during the dispensation of grace. That has to do with the fact that what the Lord was going to do is after his resurrection, he was going to give the Holy Ghost to the twelve, and that was going to empower them to know what they needed to know so that Peter could exercise the keys to the kingdom properly.